So today I'd like to uh, talk to you about some work examining how uh, coral reef fish respond to their physical environment and in some cases that they actually show quite a bit of flexibility to uh, rapid changes in, in their physical environment. So reefs are characterised by gradients in physical chemical conditions and just a couple of examples I've plucked out here are things like temperature and wave energy. And we're now in, under this uh, concern about climate change. We're developing more and more ways of measuring these gradients. We're getting more sophisticated. And in particular, we're using a lot of uh, remote sensing to upscale our understanding and measurement of these gradients. Now, the interesting thing for me is that these gradients are often associated with uh, some aspect of diversity or an ecosystem process in a, in a, in a, in a phenomenon known as biophysical coupling which is where you look at some aspect of the ecosystem and it will change according to the change in that physical parameter. So here I've given you three examples for things that we've looked at for wave energy in coral reef systems. And you can see here on the far left, we've basically now modelled the relative abundance and percent cover of a range of different functional groups of corals and how they change with different wave heights in a reef flat and crest habitat. Some of my own work looking at how functional groups of fishes will change according to the flow velocity created by waves. And there's also things like food resources. So detritus and algae, we've also now modelled across very large spatial scales across the continental shelf and tied them quite closely to the hydrodynamic environment of those reefs. Now the interesting thing for management interesting thing for management is that we can use this process, this biophysical coupling, to develop environmental sur surrogates for predictive modelling and mapping, because we can't go and survey all of these processes in every single reef throughout the Great Barrier Reef, Ningaloo or the world. What we can do, though, is use some of our remote sensing techniques to map these physical gradients and then using these concepts of biophysical coupling try and overlay that uh, and, and make some more broader scale uh, judgments about what lives where and where these processes are operating. One particular physical parameter that I've been interested in is wave-induced water motion. It's an interesting one because it's uh, multi-scale. You can see huge variations in it just within a single reef but also across the continental shelf on the Great Barrier Reef, and also across the ocean. So across the Pacific Ocean, for instance, the average wave height you'll get on the Great Barrier Reef is around 1.5 metres. If you move out towards Hawaii, it's starting to get above 5 metres. So even across an ocean, you get some quite major variations in this particular parameter. And the other thing we're noticing now is that the wave climate is changing. It really isn't on too many people's radar at the moment, but the intensity and the frequency of large wave events in particular is picking up, and not just from seismic activity like tsunamis. This is wind-driven activity. So some of the work we've done in the past is actually looking at how you can map biodiversity of coral reef fishes across wave gradients. And this is an example here where we've taken an informative trait uh, the fin, the pectoral fin of, of a coral reef fish, and from that we can predict their swimming capacity and how well they can deal with wave-driven flows. And we've looked at this now across several different lineages of fish and found a consistent pattern that the fish are arranged on reefs according to their fin shape and the average flows that you'll find in each of those different reef locations. And so this is an example of how you can use an informative trait to map coral reef fish diversity across a physical gradient, regardless of what the uh, geographic location may be. And we've tested this now in the Great Barrier Reef, French Polynesia, the Caribbean, several locations around the world, and it holds every time we test it. The question, though, is, and, and I've talked to some people here in, in Juha, they want to know about the temporal stability of these kind of bi biophysical links. They want to know, if we do some of this mapping, how stable is it? Because things are changing, and even in present context, wave climates do change. They change on a daily basis, a monthly basis, and seasonally. So this is the kind of question we've been examining most recently in our group, and the question is, do fishes display some flexibility in their response to wave-driven flows? And today I want to show you some evidence for that, certainly in a range of different traits, and I'm just going to provide three uh, short examples of how they're showing flexibility in behaviour, metabolism, and their morphology when it comes to changing physical environment in terms of wave energy. So waves change a lot. Uh, you've all worked at or in or on coral reefs, and you've noticed that from one morning to the next, or even within the one morning, you can have a calm weather condition, low wave heights, and within the matter of hours, that can double or triple. And the interesting thing is for fish, is that is associated with a very 
sharp increase in water motion. And it's not just water speed. Some of the stuff we've looked at in the past has been speed. It's not just speed. It's also the nature of that water motion. It becomes more oscillatory in nature and often doubles in terms of the number of flow direction changes you'll get per minute. And it also changes in terms of the distance or the, the amount of um, orbit, the length of the orbit, the excursion distance, will push fish around more over a reef. So these changes, and this particular data set was taken within 24 hours from one point to the next, you can see a doubling of wave energy and wave-driven flows. And the first response that fish seem to give to this kind of change is behavioural. We've noticed that in some groups, they're always using a certain type of fin. 90% uh, uh, of the time they're swimming around a reef, and that, that particular fin is the pectoral fin, the one I talked about a second ago. And so on these particular plots here, the open bars are calm weather conditions and the shaded bars are rough weather conditions. And you can see for some species, and particularly if they're in the family of the wrasses, there seems to be relatively ch uh, little change in their behaviour between rough and calm conditions. But in a whole range of other families of reef fishes, we see them starting to recruit new fins in some cases or using some fins a lot more. So we see a change in the fin behaviours to stabilise themselves underwater and all of this is also associated with breaking and turning, so the use of the pelvic fins as well. So they're, they're upping their activity, they're basically adjusting to this new environment. They're not necessarily migrating out of those habitats, which has been a suggestion in the past, that if wave energy picks up, these fish are not going to be able to cope, they're going to have to migrate to new habitats. That's not the case. They can, can, they can continue to, to exist there, they just need to change their behaviours. Now, this increased behaviour has to be powered somehow. And so this gives us an indication of another set of traits that these reef fishes can use to deal with a changing environment, and that's their metabolism. So it's fine to be able to change your fin use behaviour and increase its frequency, but you need to power that. You need to mobilise energy to do so. So we started looking at the metabolic processes that are going on in some of these fishes, and when you measure the metabolism of a fish, you can measure the rate at which they're using energy, and in this particular plot we've used oxygen use as a proxy for that. They have a rate when they're resting and not really doing too much at all. And then they'll have a rate of maximum metabolic um, energy turnover or, or oxygen consumption in this case. And the difference between those two can be described in terms of a factorial scope. And so in this particular species, it's less than three. This particular species does not occur in um, changing wave environments. They're typically in lagoonal or deep habitats where they don't really experience this change in flow that I showed you a second ago. Some of the fish that do occur in those shallow environments are like this one here, Stethodulus bandanensis, and it has a markedly different aerobic scope. It's now 22 times. And the analogy I like to use is the fish there on the left is the VW, and the one on the right is the Fiat. They have vastly different uh, metabolic engines, and the flexibility they have within those metabolic engines is similarly vast. The fish on the right has the capacity to change its metabolic processes over a much, much wider range than the one on the left. This is one aspect of the metabolic physiology that can give them flexibility. The other one is to do things more cheaply. And so if we actually look at energy consumption as a function of speed, so remember one of the things that waves do is, is create more water motion on the reef, so they have to deal with more speed per unit time. One of the things that the fish need to do then is be able to uh, increase their speed, but be able to do that sustainably without increasing massively their energy costs to do so. So if we actually look at these fishes and how much energy they consume with increasing swimming speed, you find these sort of curves, these cost of transport curves. And this one, we've got that species that I showed you a second ago that doesn't tend to occur in wave-exposed environments. They have a very narrow range of speeds over which they have minimum uh, energetic consumption. They have an optimum swimming speed that sort of sits around three and a half body lengths a second. Very narrow tolerance. Stethodulus bandanensis, on the other hand, has a vastly different energy curve or cost of transport curve. And in this case, what you see is an optimum swimming speed that is more a broadband. It stretches between five and a half and ten and a half body lengths a second. So if you like, this gives them the flexibility to choose a speed anywhere between five and a half and ten and a half according to what the environment demands of them on that given hour or day. So these things are relatively rapid changes. Some of the things that we're seeing are a little bit slower and potentially a longer term uh, adaptation to changing flows. 
are associated with the morphology of these species. An example I'd like to show you today is of a widespread species that you've sure, surely have heard about before, Acanthochromis polyacanthus. This particular species is widely abundant across a very large wave gradient, cross-shelf wave gradient on the Great Barrier Reef, which is um, remarkable in its character. This wave gradient is not even. It's actually quite uh, steep drop off from the front uh, of the outer barrier reef towards the mid shelf and inner shelf and it looks something like this. These are maximum flow speeds that we've recorded for a range of outer, mid and inner shelf reefs on the Great Barrier Reef. And if you look at the fin shapes, and remember that trait that I showed you towards the beginning of this talk, if you look at the pectoral fin shape of these species, it seems to mimic very closely that wave gradient that we've measured across the shelf. And this is significant because by changing their fin shape, they're, allowed, they're allowing themselves to produce a swimming speed that suits their flow environment. Now we're starting to dig into this because obviously there's a few mechanisms by which this can happen. It can either happen very quickly through a process like phenotypic plasticity, so within a generation, or it could be through local adaptation. And that's what we're starting to look at now. A little bit of data to give you some idea of where we're at. We're realising that as young fish, all of this species show a very similar rounded fin morphology that you can see on the left there. As they're growing, depending on which reefs they, they, they grow up on, whether it's an exposed outer shelf reef or, or a relatively sheltered inner shelf reef, they either uh, arrive at a fin morphology as adults that's tapered fin, which as you can see here in this performance plot is associated with fast, efficient swimming speeds, or if they're on those inner shelf reefs, as I suggested, the adult fish don't seem to change their fin shape. They just stay with that rounded fin, which is more suited to the slow speed locomotion. So this is very exciting, and we're hoping to get um, some handle on this. I have a PhD student, Sandra Binning, who's working on this now. And we're hoping to work out which of the two mechanisms that might be driving this particular adaptation to changing flows across that gradient. We also are getting some handle on whether there might be variability in flexibility amongst reef fish species. And this bit of data here is indicating how much variation we see in fin shape as measured by their aspect ratio between outer shelf reefs and mid shelf reefs on the Great Barrier Reef. And it's interesting that in the Pomacentra days, so the damsel fishes were actually finding that one of the data points has popped off for Embus glyphitid on Curaçao, but anyway, that in the Pomacentra day they seem to show a lot more variation in their existing populations in terms of fin shape across that gradient than something like the Aconcerid Zanclids and also we've got similar low amounts of variation in the Rasses as well. So that's interesting. We're trying to work out why that may be and does that give us some uh, indication for varied flexibility uh, to changing conditions across reef fish taxa? So just to summarise, um, it does appear that coral reef fish can display flexibility in their response to a changing, uh, in this case rapidly changing, physical parameter. This means that it does give some temporal stability to those biophysical patterns that I described earlier in this talk. It suggests that yes, there are certain tolerances to a changing environment within that biophysical relationship. So if we are going to use environmental surrogates to start mapping diversity of fish or ecosystem processes, there will be some hysteresis in those models. There's some evidence also for potential longer term adaptability through the changes in morphology, but we are starting to get suggestions that there, uh, not all fish are flexible. There is variable flexibility. And so those tolerances I was talking about in the models, the hysteresis, they'll have to be different for different species. And maybe that will fall out the level of family, which would be nice, but potentially it could be a species by species scenario. And this is particularly important for things like bioclimate envelope models, because at the moment a lot of those models are assuming static environmental tolerances. This is suggesting that's not necessarily the case. There may be some flexibility in there. <coughs> 